It's the J.R. Joker Show. Before we go any further, I want you to be frank with me, honestly. Do you think this, this stapler makes me look fat? I wish I had an audience in front of me right now, because I love to open up by saying, what a great crowd, you guys are great. No, thank you, you were great. Yeah, but if you do that, then they're obliged to applaud. He called me great. I can't remember the last time a sober person called me great. I'm not good, not nice. I'm nothing short of great. This guy called me great. Yeah, he sucks, but if he called me great, so I'll, I'll, I'll applaud a little bit. You know? So, uh, I just want to finish up uh, about two, two, three episodes ago. I was talking about name dropping, and I'm, in my mind, I, I wanted to throw in that, as I mentioned, Bob Eubanks, who's just a game show guy, and compared to some of the bigger stars I was talking about, he's nothing. Uh, and he was trying to name drop names like Glenn Ford and Cary Grant and all that. Uh, and so I worked, I, I did an infomercial with this guy, Ted Lange. Do you have any idea who that is? Uh, yet another old reference. There's a TV show that was on for like, gosh, pretty long time and a pretty long time ago. But it's like they could reboot the show at any moment and maybe it is rebooted on the Hallmark Channel or some someplace. I don't know. The Love Boat. The Love Boat. And uh, the guy that played the bartender, Isaac. He, uh, he, he's played by a fellow named Ted Lange. So, uh, I got hired to do this infomercial. And it was going to star Ted Lange. And for all I know, it's Lange. I, I, I don't, don't even remember. Um, call me Ted. Good enough. Great. And uh, before we got there, the was it his agent? Or some producer or something says to me, don't mention about him being Isaac or say anything about the love boat. Don't call him Isaac. Don't say, I liked you playing Isaac. Well, okay. I don't know, that just struck me as very strange. Uh, this guy's whole success. He, he probably got it for the second through the fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth or ninth or tenth year. Probably got a good paycheck. Probably put his kids through college uh, with that show, you know. Just chit-chatting with people on the love boat and giving him drinks or whatever. He was the bartender. Anyway, don't mention it. I don't, I don't understand this guy like had aspirations to be Macbeth or Hamlet or something like that. Well, anyway, I guess he knew that he wasn't such a big star because even he wanted the name drop. And it's a funny story, so I'll just tell it and go on to something else. He was in a play with, and this is the person about whom the story is. I'm trying to end the sentence without a preposition. Okay, Elaine Stritch. If, you, if you, that name, if that name doesn't just, oh yeah, Elaine Stritch. I know all about Broadway, and I'm gonna, Elaine Stritch. She played Alec Baldwin's mother on Thirty Rock. Does that help? I don't know. Any reference more than ten minutes ago? Uh, you, know, you could pride yourself on knowing references, but nobody else gets them. What does it matter? Uh, I was talking about one time in a club about uh, some guy at the bar was older. and I said, I bet he, he can get every reference in Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire. We didn't start the fire. It was always burning. Okay. And the audience was just like, who's Billy Joel? This, this is the kind of stuff I have to deal with. I taught high school, and I was teaching this movie class one time. I took over. It was like subbing. It was a video, video production class at Miami Beach High. And I, and I mentioned Jimi Hendrix. And they just stared at me. I mean, the high school kids, I mean, 
Don't a couple of them play the guitar and know anything about rock and roll? To me, if you don't know who Jimi Hendrix is, it's almost like you don't know who Beethoven is. I'm sure Beethoven aficionados would puke if I said, you know, if they heard me say that. I guess they're not quite on the same levels, but it's, it's, it's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a milestone in music, Jimi Hendrix, you know? There's like music before him and then there's music after him. He influenced it quite a lot. Okay, so I've digressed and forgot what I was talking about. So, 30 Rock, Elaine Stritch. Uh, obscure reference, okay. So, Elaine Stritch has a reputation of being difficult. Great actors, want much action, you get great stuff. So, she was being a real handful, uh, to put it politely. And, and he says she, she was just, you know, just being just awful. So she ordered a sandwich from a local deli. This is in New York City. Pretty easy for, for that to come true. And um, she went to the bathroom. Or she, she, had, she left for a few minutes. And so the sandwich came with a pickle. It's pretty de rigueur. And everybody was so ticked off with her, put out by her being so gritchy and everything, that uh, they took the pickle and they put it down somewhere and everybody in the cast peed on the pickle. And then they picked the pickle up and put it back on the next to the sandwich. Yeah. And Ted says that Elaine said, this is the best pickle I ever had. Elaine Schrich doesn't make any movies, and I just wanted to make a comment about a movie. I, I'm a real um, buzz killer. I buzz killed Wizard of Oz. I buzz killed The Godfather. Uh, even though I love those movies, there's, there's, each one has like glaringly big, huge plot hole mistakes, which the audience just seems like not notice. Okay, and here's another one. It's a Wonderful Life. Come on, It's a Wonderful Life. It's not a lyric from a Billy Joel song. It's a Wonderful Life. You know, the movie, it's on at Christmas, and a guy, things don't go, George Bailey, and things don't go well for him, and things look so bad, he just says, I wish I was never born. Oh, I wish I was never born. And, uh, and, and an angel who's there trying to earn his wings arranges for him to see what the world would be like if he was never born. I'm not going to tell you the whole movie. You, you absolutely know what this movie is. Come on. Um, and he learns his lesson, you know. And there you go. Zuzu's pedals. Zuzu's pedals. Okay, so at the end, he comes home and he's glad to be alive even though he's broke and maybe going to go to prison for embezzlement or something like that. And everybody that, that ever knew him, I mean, mostly poor people. They're filling up a basket w w with the money to, to replace for the money he lost, actually, that his uncle lost. And uh, and they're coming in, they're dropping, they're watching the basket, and people are giving just dot one dollar bills, and they're, and they're filling up the basket. You know, these some people coming in with their life savings, and in those days, it could be like two hundred dollars as their life savings, you know, and just just to help George, you know, because he he had such a good reputation for helping people throughout his whole life, and uh, and then finally they get a telegram from an old schoolmate. Actually, the the guy that that was in love with Mary, 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 and. Uh, but he's, he's a good sport, he's a good guy. He, he doesn't hold a grudge against George. And he had become a fabulously successful industrialist. He was a tycoon. And as soon as he heard that George was in trouble, he wired $20,000. If I'm remembering wrong, it's at least 10000 Understand, back, this was 1946. You, you, you could build yourself a house for $5,000. You know, so $10,000 is, is a lot of money. That would have gotten George out of his jam. 
Okay, so as soon as they, he reads the telegram, and then in the movie, they, they all just go, yay, hooray, 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 and then they, they all start singing, should old acquaintance be forgotten, and the, and the movie ends, you know. You know and, uh, Look, Daddy, every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. You know, I'm bad, Jimmy Stewart. Okay, so... Uh, this guy gives ten thousand dollars to the Baileys, and all these people are like, they're like, they're like broke now. And George Bailey, at this point, he he can afford to, he be lighting cigars with, with a ten dollar bill. Why why doesn't he offer the, the people their money back? Or how come no one says, "Well, George, I see you got twenty thousand dollars from your school, buddy." You think I could have my fifteen dollars back? You know, uh, I've been saving up to, to buy myself some false teeth, and sure could use those fifteen dollars. You know, no, no, no one says anything, and they they don't offer the money back. That's the first thing I would do if, if I got twenty thousand dollars. I go, well, you know, oh my pathetic poor friends, here take your your money back. As a matter of fact, here's an extra dollar for each of you. Anyway, so these films have these huge plot holes in them and nobody ever notices. So we'll fill you in with more of those things in the future. And again, if uh, this makes me look fat, write in and let me know. Okay, so again, you have been watching the J.R. Joker Show. Till next time.